Well, it's safe to say that most of you did not intend way back in January to be celebrating Easter in the way that we're celebrating it today. I'm sure back in January, you fully expected that you would celebrate Easter the way you always had. Maybe that meant a sunrise service or at your church, maybe they have a special service on Easter that's different from all the rest. Maybe the lockdown, the shelter in place order has curtailed other activities for your family. No Easter egg hunt, uh, the family meal that you typically perhaps have on an Easter Sunday couldn't be held because of the restrictions. Now there's nothing wrong with having uh, expectations and when our expectations are met, many times that gives us a sense of security, a sense of everything's right and everything is in its place, and that's the way things ought to be. But you know, sometimes God wants to take us beyond our expectations. And that's what this sermon, and really that's what Easter, is all about. This morning's sermon is titled Beyond Worldly Expectations, and it's found in Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 12. If you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them to that passage of Scripture, and we're going to be looking at it more closely here in just a few moments. You know, uh, as we uh, dive into this passage of Scripture here in just a few moments, uh, we're not going to really encounter anything that we haven't heard before. For most of us, the Easter story is very familiar. But, you know, for the people that we're going to encounter here in the text... Uh, we've got to remember that this was happening in real time. In fact, uh, we're going to encounter a group of women who went to the tomb, and we're also going to hear about some of Jesus' believers, and even one in particular, Peter. And my guess is, is that on that particular Sunday, they had some expectations, but those expectations were not met. They expected one thing and got something else. And as we see here in this passage of Scripture, uh, for them, it became a, a source of confusion. And again, we've got to remember, this was happening in real time for them. We have the uh, ability and the benefit of looking back at that event through the lens of Scripture and through time. And we know specifically what was happening though, there. We know that what was happening on that Sunday morning is that Jesus was trying to take them beyond what their average normal expectations were for that day and to help them see the hope that is found in what he did on that Easter Sunday so many years ago. You know, I want to make sure that we get this point adequately communicated here this morning because obviously we're doing things a little bit differently here today. But here's what I want to make sure that we take away from our time together today. The value of Easter isn't found in what we do. It's found in what Jesus did. You know, Easter uh, can right now be something that you didn't expect. You didn't expect to celebrate it this way. You didn't expect to be sheltering at home. There were a lot of things that are different right now, and these were things that you really couldn't anticipate or expect. Well, you know, you're in good company because 2,000 years ago, those people we're going to see in the text, they had some expectations on that Sunday morning, and not only were those expectations not met, but Jesus went beyond those expectations and did something miraculous, something that changed their lives forever. If you're a believer, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, the same thing has happened to you. Jesus has changed your life forever because of what he did 2,000 years ago. So let's not allow the differentness or the unmet expectations of this particular Easter Sunday ruin it for us. We can still celebrate Easter if we'll do just a couple of things that this passage of Scripture reveals to us. So let's take a closer look here at this passage of Scripture. As we look at verses 1 through 6, uh, we see that it helps us to know that we can celebrate the truth of the resurrection. In spite of the unusual circumstances that we're in, Easter can still be meaningful. It can still have value. If, first of all, we'll focus on the truth of the resurrection. You've got your Bibles open. Look at chapter 24 of Luke, and I'm going to read verse 1 through the first part of verse 6. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes, 
So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Now I want you to skip down now to verse 12. This mentions Peter and it says, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stopped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Now, church, those verses uh, show us, give us some hard evidence that a miracle had taken place. Jesus really was raised from the dead. That's the truth of the resurrection. And all these things that we just saw there were there, placed in this passage of Scripture, placed in Luke's Gospel, to give hard evidence of the truth, the reality that Jesus really was raised from the dead and is alive today. Let's look at four evidences here uh, of that hard truth that's given to us in this passage of Scripture. First of all, you'll notice there that it says that the stone was rolled away there in verse 2. Matthew's Gospel tells us that an angel did that, but the truth is, is that uh, the women went there expecting to have to maybe deal with that stone. In fact, one of the Gospels uh, tells that they were wondering how they were going to move the stone. But when they got there, the stone was rolled away. And as I said, Matthew's Gospel says an angel did that. And as someone has rightly said, church, uh, the stone was rolled away not so Jesus could get out of the tomb. The stone was rolled away so that we could see the hard evidence that something miraculous had happened, that the tomb was empty. And that's the next bit of hard evidence that we see there in verse 3. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now they expected to. They expected to see the body of Jesus and to prepare his body with spices, but they didn't find him. That expectation was not met. And so we see once again that here is hard evidence Jesus was not in the tomb. Now, uh, there's another bit of hard evidence there at the beginning of verse 6. There the angels say, he is not here, but he has risen. Now, let's remember, church, that angels were messengers of God, so they only spoke the message that God wanted them to speak. And what did they say? Jesus is not here. He is risen. In other words, he has resurrected from the dead. That's about as clear as you can possibly make it. And then finally, we see there in verse 12, where we skip down to, Peter got up, ran to the tomb. He stooped to look in. He saw only the linen cloths. You know, that's said and written in such a way where it suggests to us that what he saw were the linen cloths still piled up on the bench that the body had been laid upon as if the body had somehow simply disappeared. And it says that he walked away amazed at that. Now, in all of these situations, the women were perplexed. Peter was amazed. He was wondering, what in the world can this possibly mean? Once again, you and I have the benefit of knowing what it means. There's only one logical answer for that, and that is that Jesus really did rise up from the dead. He really is alive. The truth of the resurrection is that Jesus did defeat death, and he is alive today. That that tells us this, church, the greatest threat that we will ever face, death. That's something that Jesus has defeated, and he has defeated it forevermore. Last week, as we saw in the book of Romans, it makes it very clear. Jesus defeated death, and death will no more rule over him. Now, that's a reason to celebrate, church. You right now, in the privacy of your own home or in the, in the area where you have chosen to watch this video, you can celebrate right now the truth that the one that you have placed your faith in has defeated the greatest threat you'll ever face, death. That's reason to celebrate, in spite of whatever limitations we might be facing. We can also celebrate not just the truth of the resurrection, but also the hope of the resurrection. And we see that in verses five and six. Uh, Look at those verses there. It says, so the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. Now that's a part of the story there and we're breaking into it. But obviously what's happening is that the women are in the tomb. These two angels appear. They're terrified 
They don't know what to think, but they, the angels ask a question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? You know, that question reveals a lot. It reveals a spiritual truth, and that spiritual truth is this. Real life is found only in a resurrected Christ. Now, we can't be too hard on these women uh, for reacting the way they did. If I had been in their shoes, I probably would have followed in the same path, been perplexed about the stone being rolled away, not knowing what to think with, that the body of Jesus was not there. Yet the angels rightly pointed out to them that Jesus had spoken many times about what was going to happen to him, that he was going to be betrayed and crucified, but on the third day, he was going to rise again. Jesus had told them that many, many times. Well, Jesus not only made good on his words, but it also helps us understand what he can do for us. You see, what Jesus did by being resurrected from the dead was give us hope when we encounter death ourselves. You see, many in our world are searching for significance. They're searching for hope. They're searching for security, for love. They're searching for that. Those are common things that as human beings we all look for. But the question needs to be asked of them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? In other words, there are many in our world who are looking for those things that I just named, security and peace and love and hope, but they're looking in the fallen structure of our world. And that's a dead place. Our world is fallen. It is under the realm of sin. It cannot provide hope. It cannot provide security. Yet many people try and find those things in a fallen world. Let's celebrate the truth of the matter here, and that is that we have hope in Jesus Christ because of his resurrection. In other words, our search for hope can end when we embrace Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's only in him and what he has done that we have hope for the future. The world can give it to us. And we need to stop looking for those eternal things in the world, which is not eternal. Our eternal needs can only be met by an eternal God. And Jesus Prove that he is the eternal God by defeating death and by being alive today. So we can celebrate the hope of the resurrection. We no longer have to look for our sense of security and peace and joy in what the world offers. We have an eternal source for that, and his name is Jesus. We can also celebrate the necessity of, of the resurrection. Look there at verse seven. This is something that the angel said to the women there. And in verse seven, they said, it is necessary that the son of man be betrayed unto the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Now we'll deal with that word necessity here in just a few moments. It's an important word in that passage of scripture right there. But let's look at the content of what they said, because in that statement, we see the gospel. What does it say there? It's necessary that the son of man, and we know that to be Jesus's favorite way of referring to himself, but not just as a nickname. That was his way of saying that he is the supreme sacrifice. He is the one who is the bridge between God and man, perfect in every way. The son of man was betrayed to sinful men. In other words, even though he had lived a perfect life, our world deemed him a criminal. And it says that he was crucified there in that verse. But it also says that he was raised on the third day. His crucifixion was his willingness to pay the price for our sin. And his resurrection, obviously, was his victory over death that he holds out to every person that puts their faith in him. That's the gospel, church. Jesus died for us, paid the price for our sin, but was raised on the third day so that we can have life in him and be forgiven. Jesus did that for you and me. Now, the, the Bible says, the angels said, that it was a necessity 
for that to happen. What made it a necessity? You know, that word necessity almost sounds as if uh, Jesus had to do it. He didn't have any choice in the matter, but that's not what that really means. That word necessity there in the Greek means uh, what ought to happen, what's appropriate. And so when it says it was necessary that Jesus die on the cross and be raised the third day, it wasn't saying that Jesus had no choice, but it was saying that his love for us is so great that it was the appropriate thing for him to do. You see, Jesus, as he looked at humanity's sinful condition and the hopelessness and the helplessness that sin had placed us in, he also realized that he alone could resolve that problem for us. Only he could find a way, could make a way for sinful humanity to have a right relationship with God. It was only through Jesus' death and burial and resurrection that that could happen. And so Jesus, because of his love for us, seeing our pitiful condition, because he loved us so much, it was necessary. It was appropriate. It was the right thing for Jesus to do. And again, it's because he loves us with such a great love. Well, you know, even though things are different here today, church, Easter is still Easter. And even if we're not celebrating it the same way we typically do, it's still the greatest day this world has ever seen. The greatest event that has ever been recorded took place on Easter. When Jesus was raised from the dead, We've never seen anything like that. Oh, yes, there have been others that Jesus raised from the dead, but no one but Jesus has permanently defeated death. Only he is victorious over death for all of eternity. So my suggestion to you this morning is that we, instead of focusing on the things that we can't do, this Easter, let's focus on what Jesus did do for you and for me. So to kind of tie that in with our theme here today, Jesus wants to take you beyond your worldly expectations of celebrating this Easter and maybe put aside the fact or the idea that because there wasn't an Easter egg hunt or because we didn't get to have a worship service that somehow Easter is less than it should be. No, Easter is everything it's supposed to be because it proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you'll go beyond your earthly or worldly expectations and embrace the truth about Easter, Easter today will be just as meaningful for you as it has been in the past and hopefully will be in the future. We know, church, we're here in my shop here for a reason. And that reason is to finally, uh, as we close here, uh, wrap everything up together with what Jesus did for us. As we said, Easter isn't about what we do, it's about what Jesus did. And so 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who came to live among us because he loves us, knowing he would go to a cross and die a criminal's death, Jesus made a way for you and me in order to have a right relationship with God. Most of us are familiar with the fact that Jesus perhaps followed in his father's footsteps and learned the trade of a carpenter. And carpentry really uh, revolves around some basic principles and some very basic tools. Yes, they can get pretty fancy nowadays, but back in Jesus's day, I'm sure his tools were fairly simple. It seems ironic then that our world took Jesus, the carpenter, and used some very basic tools of carpentry as a way of saying to him, we don't want you here. Yes, 2,000 years ago, our world took some old wood, took some nails, took a hammer. And in an action of irony, they said to the carpenter, we're going to use the very things, the trade of your life, to get rid of you. And they handed these things to Jesus as a way of saying, we don't want you. 
But you know what Jesus did with these things? He took that hammer and those nails and that wood and he built the bridge. He built the bridge between you and God. He made a way so that you and I can have a right relationship with God. And when he was resurrected from the dead 2,000 years ago, that sealed the deal. We can celebrate the truth of Easter. It really did happen. And we can celebrate the hope of Easter. Jesus has defeated death and he holds that out to anyone who places their faith in him. And we can celebrate the necessity of the resurrection because when Jesus died on the cross, it was his way of saying, I would rather die than spend eternity without you. So I hope this Easter, you'll not let your circumstances get in the way of celebrating the great day that this is. Easter is still Easter. And I pray that the truth of that will be a part of your celebration here today. It's possible maybe that you've made a decision here based upon what the Bible says. Maybe there's been something that's happened in your life from a spiritual perspective. And I want you to know that I and, and Kevin and Charles, we're available. Just call us. We'll do any, anything and everything we can to make sure that you have done what's necessary to be in a right relationship with Christ. We love you, church. We we're looking forward to that time when we will be together again soon. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you again real soon.